Thank you to each and every one of you for being here with us today to discuss how Hong Kong's national security law has decimated the Hong Kong freedom. The Beijing implemented national security law came into effect in Hong Kong about a year ago on June 30th, 2020. One year later today, Hong Kongers have lost the right to attend public protests and assemblies. About 100 pro-democracy activists are arrested. Apple Daily, Hong Kong's largest pro-democracy publication, has been shut down, and numerous political organizations have been dissolved. Today, the presenters of the roundtable are composed with prominent young politicians of Korea, of a former politician of Hong Kong, a top consultant of Apple Daily, and a young democratic campaigner of Hong Kong. Congresswoman Yu ho Dong is the host of this roundtable here today. She's from the Justice Party. And the chairperson of the Conservative Party, Yi jun Seok, is attending as well. 네, 안녕하세요. 대한민국의 국회의원 류호 정입니다. Good morning. I am Liu ho Jung, a member of the National Assembly of the Republic of Korea. 작년 한국의 60 항쟁을 기념해서 조슈아 옹, 네이선 로와 함께 대담을 했던 기억이 납니다. 그때 제가 홍콩의 시민들의 증인이 되겠다는 말을 전했었는데요. 그러나 그날의 만남이 무색하게도 중국은 홍콩 국가보안법을 단 15분 만에 통과시켰습니다. I remember having a virtual meeting with Joshua Wong and Nathan Lau last year in commemoration of the June 10th democratic struggle in Korea of 1987. I had given my word to bear witness for the people of Hong Kong. But as if to show that such meetings are in vain, China passed the Hong Kong National Security Law in only 15 minutes. 네, 홍콩 국가보안법 시행 이후 많은 사람들이 체포됐는데요. 정치인들은 의원직에서 박탈됐고 당을 해산해야 했습니다. 그리고 청년 활동가를 포함한 많은 분들이 망명을 선택했고 홍콩에 남기로 선택한 사람들은 숨죽인 채 살아갈 수밖에 없게 됐습니다. Many people were arrested after the imposition of the NSL. Politicians have been stripped of their parliamentary mandate and their political party has been dissolved. Many, including young activists, have chosen to go on exile, and those who decided to remain in Hong Kong have little choice but to live in silence. 최근 꿋꿋하게 홍콩 시민들의 목소리를 대변해온 빈가일보의 폐간 소식을 들었습니다. 빈가일보 사옥 앞에서 홍콩 시민들이 마지막 구슬을 사들고 모여서 서로를 부둥켜하는 사진을 봤습니다. 빈가일보는 폐간됐지만 시민들의 민주화를 향한 열망은 여전히 뜨겁게 살아 있다는 것을 느낄 수 있었습니다. Recently we heard the concerning news of the closing of Apple Daily, which had steadfastly represented the voice of the Hong Kong people. I saw a photo of people embracing each other in front of the Apple Daily office with the last issue of the newspaper in their hands. It demonstrated that although the newspaper is no more, People's aspiration for democracy remains as passionate as ever. 어, 불과 40년 전만 해도 대한민국의 상황은 지금의 홍콩과 크게 다르지 않았습니다. 많은 사람들이 체포되고 국가 폭력에 희생되었는데요. 그럼에도 포기하지 않고 끝까지 저항하는 사람들이 있었고 그런 사람들 덕분에 대한민국은 결국 민주주의를 이뤄낼 수 있었습니다. 저는 오늘 이 자리에 함께 해주신 테드 후이 전 의원님, 막 사이먼, 핀 라우 스코 스티븐스 여러분들이 그런 사람들이라고 생각합니다. Only 40 years ago, the situation in Korea was not so different from that of Hong Kong. Many people were arrested and sacrificed by the country's violence. Nevertheless, there were people who did not give up the resistance. And because of these people, we have managed to achieve democracy. And I believe that you are these people for Hong Kong. 오늘 잘 기담아 듣고 홍콩의 봄을 위해 함께할 수 있는 방법을 모색하겠습니다. 환영하고 또 감사합니다. I look forward to listening to your words today and seek a way to work together with you to uh, usher in the spring in Hong Kong. I extend to you my warmest welcome and thanks for joining us this morning. 네, 이어서 소개시켜 드리고 싶은 분이 있는데요. 어, 홍콩의 민주화 운동에 굉장히 관심이 많은 분입니다. 19년도에 직접 홍콩 민주화 운동에 참여하시기도 했고요. 이번에 저희 의원실에서 주최 이 간담회를 주최한다는 것을 아시고 직접 참여 의사를 밝혀 오셨습니다. 국민의힘 
이준석 당대표님 인사말 듣고 시작하도록 하겠습니다. And now before we begin, I would like to introduce to you a very special guest that we have with us today. And um, he is uh, very interested in the democratic um, movement in Hong Kong. And in 2009, he was in Hong Kong and he actually participated in uh, the movements there. And when he heard that we were holding this roundtable this morning, he was very interested and wanted to take part in it. And so I'm very honored to introduce to you Honorable Mr. Lee jun Sok, the chairman of the People Power Party. I would like to say hello to everyone online uh, participating in this roundtable. Uh, uh, as mentioned, I am the uh, chairperson for the major opposition party in Korea, People Power Party, and I uh, participated in the uh, 2019 protest against uh, the Hong Kong uh, police uh, in August and uh, September. I am participating in this session because I was so surprised by the fact that the Hong Kong government is actually trying to suppress a freedom of speech uh, by uh, suppressing Apple Daily recently. Surprisingly, the Korean government today, Korean ruling party is also trying to pass the new media bill that suppresses uh, freedom of speech. I would definitely be uh, on the same line with you people against uh, cruelties happening in Hong Kong. I mentioned the word cruelty because uh, last week I had an interview with Bloomberg and I used the word, word uh, cruel to uh, describe what is going on there in Hong Kong. And recently the Chinese Communist Party was really upset with my usage of the word uh, cruel, but I cannot find a better way to uh, describe the situation there uh, from what I actually saw. So I definitely want to get recent updates on the Hong Kong issue today. And I have a lot of questions for you. I'm really looking forward to uh, get great information today. And as a pioneer, pioneering nation in the region, in the field of democracy, Korea has an obligation to help the people of Hong Kong and spread democracy in the region. We'll definitely be uh, helping you guys throughout the uh, democratization process. Now we will start with Ted Hui, a former legislator of Hong Kong. He will be making a statement. Um, thank you so much for inviting me and giving me giving us these opportunities from Hong Kongers and those who care about Hong Kong to discuss Hong Kong situations. And I do value and treasure every moment that I have uh, to talk about Hong Kong, to state our case, um, because Hong Kong is experiencing a really, really tough time. So I'll start off by um, uh, giving an overall uh, general overview of Hong Kong situation now and my analysis of or my expectations of what is going to happen uh, in Hong Kong uh, in the near future. So. Um, this month, uh, July, marked the 24th uh, anniversary of Hong Kong's uh, handover to China. And traditionally on July the 1st, uh, people would go on to the street, take to the street for rally, for district demonstrations, for freedom and democracy in Hong Kong. And especially uh, traditionally for universal suffrage, one man, one vote, democracy that we aimed for uh, for the past decades. But now it's, it's universal suffrage is a goal that is very far away, it's very remote. It seems even sarcastic to even talk about in Hong Kong because for the last two years, we've totally lost our freedoms in Hong Kong and all our fundamental rights uh, because they are totally decimated by the CCP regimes in Hong Kong. And now I don't think uh, we will ever have any street demonstrations or rally in Hong Kong. So um, the 1st of July and July in Hong Kong is no longer a day for rally for uh, freedom and democracy. It's, it's more like remembrance of grievance of losing freedom in Hong Kong. It reminds me also of my experience um, in 2017. At that time, I visited uh, South Korea. I went to Gwangju, 
uh, with the delegations. And then I participated uh, in the uh, remembrance events in the cemetery uh, for the Guangzhou uprising. And I remember listening to the uh, president's speech and how it, how I felt connected that a country, uh, of course, uh, with a, a history of struggle towards democracy and how people sacrificed. And yes, I believe Hong Kong is experiencing a similar moments and facing police brutality and all the persecutions um, by the regimes. So I'll also start off by uh, explaining uh, the real life scenarios and situations and how Hong Kongers has gone through uh, our, our past two years in 2019, 2020. So uh, I left Hong Kong uh, at the end of 2020 and I can still recall the last three months before I left for the three consecutive months I've been arrested and I have a uh, police raid to my home, a uh, sudden raid in the morning at 6 p.m. arrested me and questioned me, laid charges against me, handcuffed me, sent me direct, directly to the police stations. And then I stayed there overnight and directly to court. So luckily I got bail for the three charges for the three consecutive months. But unluckily, uh, many of my comrades and my parliamentarian colleagues, my uh, uh, freedom fighter friends in the streets, they couldn't get bailed. So you can imagine in days like that, any freedoms that if you ever enjoyed could be your last, could be there's, there can be no chance of you saying goodbye to your family, to your loved ones. And the next time you see the arrested person, in freedom, maybe in e years or decades. That's what's been happening to my friends, my my parliamentarians, colleagues, my comrades among us. We're losing them one by one. And it's quite a heavy and painful experience. And of, of course, not to mention that how we lost uh, the whole newspaper media groups and, and Mark is going to talk about that for sure. Many journalists are being persecuted, being criminally charged and forced to leave their position as journalists. And of course, not to mention how we lost uh, our, our judicial independence, judiciary that Hong Kong people used to trust in Hong Kong. Now it's so interfered uh, by the regimes with the newly introduced national security law. So, um, the national security law uh, that's been introduced a year ago marks a brutal paradigm shift in Hong Kong, distorting the indiv individualist right-based norms and virtues uh, Hong Kong once had, and switching Hong Kong into a complete police state, ruling Hong Kong with fear and deterrence and a typical totalitarianism. So now, nowadays, uh, the CCP, I would say, is the biggest enemy of freedom and democracy that's been running Hong Kong. So, uh, and I'd also say that uh, the CCP, Hong Kong regimes and the China regimes is a threat, not only to Hong Kong, but to the whole world. So, I, it's my determination that Hong Kong's goal shouldn't be just going back and to revert Hong Kong back to how it was, because we Hong Kongers already have enough of unfulfilled promises and lies of the CCP regimes in Hong Kong. So our goal is no longer, I would say, one country, two system. I personally don't buy it. Hong Kongers don't buy it. We don't trust that anymore. I, I believe that our goal is to uh, have CCP step down from power, to have the regime step, step down from power. Then Hong Kongers, the diaspora, people like me, dissidents, 
uh, living in exiles, will go home together in a revived Hong Kong in glory. And let's not rem let's not forget how Hong Kongers uh, survived all the police brutality. I've personally experienced all all kinds of police weapons, or all, all um, thousands and ten thousand rounds of tear gas, pepper sprays, water cannons, police batons. I've witnessed firsthand how young people um, being brutally beaten up. So my expectations of Hong Kong in the near future is that there will be more and more dissidents being locked up and not only uh, politicians, but all activists. And it's still happening uh, on a daily basis, day by day. It breaks my heart to read Hong Kong news every day, seeing all the young people at their teenage, at their, at their early 20s, they are being locked up. And I can also expect more media group to close down, forced to close down to like Apple Daily because the regime can no longer tolerate any dissent, any criticism, and more and more journalists being persecuted, being uh, ch criminally charged and put to jail, and more professions being disqualified or punished. And we can see, for example, teachers now being heavily persecuted. They are disqualified for just using uh, wrong textbooks, that supports freedom and democracy, or for their speech uh, over the internet, on social media, regarding how they support freedom and democracy. Now, those teachers are, are being complained of, and they are punished for losing their qualifications for permanently for life. They cannot, cannot be teachers anymore. So this is what happening, what's happening in different professions in Hong Kong. Uh, as long as there's a profession and you're a professional and support Hong Kong's freedom and democracies, you're disqualified. You lose your professions. That's what the regime is doing to professionals. So um, there are different things that can be done internationally. And as um, a person in exile uh, speaking for Hong Kong's freedom and democracy on advocacy, of course, I stress that sanctions uh, by different countries can be powerful. Of course, sanctions wouldn't change uh, Hong Kong's regimes or Beijing's behavior uh, 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 immediately. But I still argue that it's important because sanctions is, is a sign, is the gesture um, that free countries uh, will not tolerate these kinds of persecutions anymore. And free, free countries will not live up to the so-called new international orders and values created by the CCP regimes that represents oppressions to freedoms. So it's sanctioned is also a, a reassurance to Hong Kongers and for those who are suffering from persecutions um, by the CCP regimes, and it doesn't only, it's not for only for Hong Kongers, but also for the Uyghurs, for the Taiwanese, for the Myanmar, the Myanmar who's been, uh, who's uh, military government supported by the CCP regimes. So it's also, it's a reassurance for those who are suffering and to, to a recognition of their calls. And also it's a reassurance for the allies uh, of the free countries in the world that they are now joining hands together against the repression, against uh, the threats that CCP uh, is spreading uh, globally. So it's it's important. So it's also a sign that uh, free countries, uh, I mean, um, the CCP uh, will not benefit from uh, the existing world order that, as if business as usual. So I, I strongly argued for sanctions from free countries against officials in Beijing and in, in Hong Kong for, for their wrongdoing, for their penetration to human rights. Of course, uh, what more can be done? Of course, lifeboat plans, because Hong Kongers are now in danger. And quite many young uh, protesters, they need a safe place to go to. And so that uh, they can continue their fight, their cause. 
And so, uh, for example, the UK has been uh, providing lifeboat schemes and tailor-made for Hong Kong, Hong Kongers, BNO schemes. And I, I wish that uh, places like uh, countries like where I am in Australia and of course Canada, the Five Eyes, but not limited to those, but Asian countries, Korea, Japan, I, I hope that uh, they can look seriously into the, the issues and to receive Hong Kongers uh, from the terrors of the C CCP. And I would say that Hong Kongers is very adoptive. They are they have the, they have all the advantages of contributing to the society while continuing their advocacy for Hong Kongs. So to be a contribution for to those countries, I, I think it'll be a win-win. Of course, uh, what more can be done by free countries? A more boycotting approach, iso isolating approach towards uh, Beijing in, in terms of China policy. It's a boycott can be diplomatic and can be economic. So uh, we've been uh, Hong Kongers with other ethnic minorities persecuted by the CCP. We are, for example, we are calling for a, a diplomatic boycott of the Winter Olympics in 2022. And I think that will be a very effective measure in pressuring, maximizing the pressure on Beijing. And so uh, finally, what Hong Kong diaspora is doing now, of course, Hong Kongers are getting together. And we believe that even though we are overseas, we still are in lines, we still join hands, we still walk abreast, we, we, we get together, we maintain our language and culture, we tell our stories, we state our case to uh, civil societies and uh, different professions in our respective countries. And from that, from the bottom, we make our influence and we meet parliamentarians, government officials, and we hope to be a bigger stakeholder. And we, we hope that free countries and not only the governments, but the people we understand our situations so that uh, they value uh, not only the economic interests of their respective countries, they, I hope that they valued uh, the universal value of human rights and freedom and democracy. And that's the only thing that we are after. So that's uh, uh, been, these are the things that we've been doing uh, internationally and in our respective countries. And I, I, again, I thank you for the op this opportunity for letting us to speak so that you understand more of Hong Kong situations. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have and go to any debate so that um, Hong Kong's case can be told uh, in more details. I'll pause here and leave the time for other uh, speakers. Thank you very much. Now, Mark Simon, a top consultant and a right-hand man of Apple Daily's magnate, Jimmy Lai, will be making a statement. Good morning. Thanks, everybody, for having me, for your valuable time and the honor of speaking here today. Um, as you, uh, just, I'm just introduced. I'm Mark Simon. I'm currently in the New York, New Jersey area. Uh, to give you some background, I spent the last 21 years um, working for Jimmy Lyon, holding senior positions in our media divisions, undertaking everything from general manager of Apple Daily to group director of the entire group. Uh, the entire time of those 21 years, I worked directly for Mr. Lai, and he described me often as either his assistant or as his uh, either his assistant or as his deputy, uh, depending on what he's just discussing that day. There's really no aspect of the Apple Daily situation I can't discuss, and I look forward to questions uh, at a later date. Uh, currently, I would also add, and this is what I'm leading into, I'm also wanted in Hong Kong, like uh, the other gentleman up here with me, um, on various criminal counts related to Apple Daily's Hong Kong businesses, as well as two national security charges, uh, one that was actually outlined in public last week against Finn and I during a court hearing for Andy Lee. I bring this up not as some badge of honor, but in part to show that the shuttering of Apple Daily was not just about the closure of a free press, but rather the destruction of a business, Hong Kong's open markets and rule of law. I was not targeted because I'm some important figure in the democracy movement. The other gentlemen here are joining us. They're important. Not or because I was a journalist. 
but rather I was a key player in the business of the company. The goal with me was to disrupt the business. A proper and fully functioning society requires a free press that is operating in an open and free market. No market is free if it is dependent on the government for its revenues, for the revenues of a media. Certainly there's a place for public broadcasters, the BBC, NPR, in Korea there's public broadcasters, nonprofits, and I'm wide open, anybody can basically have a publishing platform in my world. Yet it's impossible for there to be press freedom if the government controls all the funding and the revenues of the media. Uh, to paraphrase the old Russian Lenin, the communist leader, if you want to control the newspapers, you control the paper. The Hong Kong government has added their own version to Lyndon's approach. Not only have they attacked the business of Apple Daily and our revenues, but the individuals and the suppliers and vendors who work with us. In other words, making it impossible for a free press to operate. Apple Daily was put out of business by the government of Hong Kong at the direction of the Communist Party. It's kind of ironic that as soon as my boss, Jimmy, saw the introduction of the extradition treaty in 2018-19, he made it very clear the treaty was going to be used to target one group, Apple Daily, to bring our, if our journalists write something, bring them to China. If our business people do something, bring them to China. When the extradition treaty failed and the national security law was introduced, once again, Jimmy said, well, they're coming back for a second try and maybe we have two years. It looked like we only had one, as we can see. Now, I think most of you are familiar with the story of how they cracked down on the free press in Hong Kong. But quickly, the first target was the public broadcaster, RTHK, which is Royal Telev uh, the Television, the government television agency. Long history of independence, long history of non-interference from government. Within months after the national security law, the government had full control by management changes and just firing some reporters. Apple Daily was a bit harder for them because Apple Daily operates in the marketplace. So this is the real point that one of the things that I think people have kind of missed from closing the free press. For the past 10 years, Apple Daily, if you, if you advertise in Apple Daily, you were guaranteed 100% to be contacted by the Chinese and urged not to advertise. This inc we, but in fairness, we did have a lot of companies, including some Korean company who stayed with us. But after July 1st, 2020, we saw it coming. There was no way anybody could stay with us. The threat was too great to the employees. So what we did and worked fantastically is we moved to a subscription system. The subscription system in Hong Kong, we have over 600,000 subscribers. At one point in time, when we opened up, we had close to a million. Hong Kong Apple Daily is a viable company. It's incredibly important. The Hong Kong Apple Daily was cash flow positive. And the day they shut us down, we had over 50 million US dollars in the bank. That was certified to the Hong Kong Stock Exchange and acknowledged by the Hong Kong Stock Exchange. In fact, even today, there's close to that amount that's still sitting in the bank and the company could still be operating. So what happened is when they couldn't beat us through other ways, they just cut off everything. It's illegal for banks to handle the funds of Apple Daily. It's illegal for us to even pay the Apple Daily employees for the National Security Act. So what they did is they used economic measures to crush the free press. And that's really quite important. Remember, they came in with police and raided us with over 300 officers twice and walked away. But behind the scenes, they were contacting the banks, they were contacting our landlords, they were putting pressure on our vendors, and at the end of the day, they were arresting our senior executives and tragically basically making these individuals stop working. The CCP now owns all the media and major media in Hong Kong. There are still some small, small players out there, and they do valiant work and they work very hard. But the fact of the matter is, in a major society, mass media matters. The big media companies really do set the tone and the tenure 
for ideas, links, and breaths in the, in the marketplace. So what has happened to Hong Kong is basically the government controls every major media outlet, mass media outlet. They control it through either direct ownership or the fact is they have their pro-Beijing cronies who control everything. Now, one of the things about Apple Daily being crushed that I think I have to make clear and I'll divert from my comments for a second is Jimmy Lai, my boss, always talks about rights and freedoms as baskets. In other words, we protect the freedom of religion because we know people who oppress the freedom of religion will also oppress the freedom of, of the press. We know a dictator who represses the freedom of the press will also play with the markets. We know somebody who will get involved in education will also get involved in the markets or in ways of life. So Hong Kong is actually the perfect example of how the CCP moves to crush organizations and ideas they don't like. Essentially, a free press organization with journalists sitting out there had a frontal assault on the rights of the press through the arrest of some of our journalists and some of our editors. And, but more effectively, they undermined the business and the free market. So in Hong Kong, one of the things that shows how destructive destroying a free press is, is they've shattered the rule of law in going after us. Um, they've stripped Mr. Lai of, of he's, we're a public listed company, and they just came in and they stripped Mr. Lai of his shareholding rights. He owns 71% of the company, which is the reason why I have a consultant title right now uh, for Mr. Lai, but not for the company, because he has no more voting rights in his own company. They essentially locked up editors, targeted senior business executives, myself included, and others, and moved them out of the business. And then finally, the worst thing in my mind, what they've done is they've now set an environment where they control all the news. And that's a very important point for people to look at. Yes, there is the international press there. There's Bloomberg, there's the New York Times, there's international journalists, but they are not solely concerned with the government and the daily facts that go on in Hong Kong. I think as Asia starts to look at this, this is a model that Asia needs to consider how China is gonna spread. For example, Inside Korea, I can assure you there are Chinese language newspapers. Who are the owners of those newspapers? Who do they represent? What are their views? Who do they back? What, 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 part, what, are, they, what are they mobilizing in Korean society? What are they trying to do? Who are the, who are the business associates, associations, Chinese business associations in Korea? What are they doing? What are they talking about? Because my, the point is, in Hong Kong, essentially, we have seen the undermining of civil society, rule of law, and a free press. They work all at once. Everything comes together in one way, and they, they, and they destroy it all at once. The other thing, and I think Koreans actually know this very, very well, the worst thing about dealing with dictators is, I have to say, after watching the Hong Kong people for having lived there for over 25 years. You've never seen a people more resilient. You've never seen a people really beat the government on a regular basis all the time until this very last move. And that's because as tyrants, at the end of the day, they get as many bites at the apple as they need. In other words, they just keep coming back and coming back. And my fear is that the rest of Asia and other places are, are going to be caught off guard as China starts to spread the ideas of, of, the, of the CCP around Asia and start trying to make them legitimate. They're going to do the same thing that they've done with the Hong Kong media with overseas Chinese media. And it's something that I could, that's the only thing really I could ever argue for in Korea is I think Koreans need to take a real look at Chinese propaganda efforts in South Korea. I know that doesn't affect a lot of things in Hong Kong right now, but I'm primarily focused on the media and the information war because the point is in Korea where people have a strong and natural belief in democracy, 
if there's not ways for the democracy movement abroad to at least be heard by the elites and the intellectuals in the Korean society, and a lot of time that comes up from what we call ethnic media, in other words, Chinese language media, then it becomes very difficult for the Korean people to understand what's really happening inside places like Hong Kong and China. I'll leave it at that. If you have any questions about Apple Daily, I'll, I'll feel I'll happily answer. Now it's Mr. Bin Lau's turn, a 28-year-old pro-democracy activist and a founder of Hong Kong Liberty. So uh, a group of pro-democracy Hong Kongers organized an exhibition in Seoul uh, last month as part of the Hong Kong Be Water 2021 Global Campaign. So be, being one of the co-initiators of the campaign, I had wished I could fly to Seoul to support the fans in person and connect with more Koreans. This is therefore a particularly exciting opportunity here today to be able to meet you at least virtually and exchange ideas with the Korean parliament and civil society. So as I mentioned by the host, I'm the founder of the Hong Kong Liberty Team, one of the 10,000 arrestees and one of the Hong Kong activists in exile wanted under the Hong Kong National Security Law NSL. As Mark has mentioned, he and I have been charged against the NSL and our names have been repeatedly brought up in the trials against Jimmy Lai and other pro-democracy figures. There has been a long story behind how I ended up uh, an activist in exile. So before becoming an activist, I was a professional in the construction industry and have worked with Samsung in a number of infrastructure projects across different countries before. Back in 2019, upon the introduction of the extradition bill, which sparked the most recent pro-democracy movement in Hong Kong, I founded several action groups and laid down the groundwork for the international line of the movement with no network and resources to start with at the time. But as these were built, I have subsequently launched different initiatives on both the international and local lines of Hong Kong's fight against the CCP. My work included the organization of global newspaper advertisement campaigns and multiple rounds of global rallies, as well as arranging for foreign parliamentarians to visit Hong Kong. I also proposed the doctrine and strategy of Lam Chao, which is a Cantonese land term for the if we burn, you burn with us sentiment, which you may be familiar with from the Hunger Games, the movie. So what is the reason why uh, Hong Kongers are keen to burn with the CCP, even when it implies self-destruction? In essence, Hong Kongers have been burned by the CCP since the 1960s, whilst almost all former colonies around the world were granted the right of self-determination under the United Nations, Hong Kongers were deprived of such, uh, of such a basic right and any comprehensive democratic reforms due to Beijing's militant threat and pressure. While still Britain was forced to hand over Hong Kong to China in 1997, although Hong Kong should in theory be protected by the UN lock Sino-British Joint Declaration for 50 years, we have instead witnessed the accelerating dismantlement of Hong Kong's autonomy, democracy, and people's civil liberties. While Jimmy Lai has been put into jail, a number of Apple Daily's executive directors and journalists were arrested three weeks ago under the NSL. The assets of the media group have also been frozen without any trial to warrant the penalty. This cash flow cutoff resulted in the shutdown of the largest pro-democracy mass media and the last pro-democracy paper print in Hong Kong. There are three pillars to any international financial center. First, the rule of law. Second, the protection of private property rights and third, press freedom. Under the CCP totalitarian rule, Hong Kongers have lost nearly all kinds of civil liberties and the rule of law. And the with the demise of Apple Daily, it is clear that Hong Kong no longer qualifies as an international financial center. All businesses in Hong Kong are literally hostages in the hands of the CCP. It's therefore no longer safe for foreign countries, including Korea, to invest and conduct business in the city. Korean enterprises should seriously consider retreating from the city before it becomes too late. But then many of you in Korea may ask, is Hong Kong doomed for real? Is there anything that Korea could help or do to help? Well, it may sound paradoxical, but I believe Hong Kong can be reborn and rise again someday. And we, the Hong Kongers are probably on the right path. 
Between the 1980s and 2019, all democracies in the world, especially the US, used to adopt the so-called engagement policy as the underpinning principle to their foreign policies towards China. However, it, it only ended up with the rise of the totalitarian giant who has mastered the dark arts of infiltration and control of other countries. This regime has additionally be convicted the crime of genocide. Today, following our final awakening to the CCP's heavy hand in 2019, we continue on our journey outwards to pass on our hand hard-earned learnings to the world. Fortunately, the world seems to also be waking up after 2019, and the paradigm has gradually shifted from the engagement policy to a tough China policy, thereby starting to contain Beijing's infiltration and regional hegemony. What the international community, including Korea, has to do is to continue moving away from feeding and over-relying on the blood-stained Chinese monies. Only by starving the CCP economically with measures such as collective sanctions, as mentioned by Ted, we may we have a fair chance to prevent hot wars and encroachment by such an aggressive regime. Looking at the collapse of the USSR, I believe history can replete if we jointly adopt the right strategy. With the CCP collapse, Hong Kong, Macau, Tibet, and Xinjiang will be freed. Many Hong Kongers have said, we are going through hell. I used to agree, but I am now less pessimistic. This is because whenever I feel lost about the future of Hong Kong, I would look into world history for guidance and enlightenment. A country that has always inspired me is Korea especially with the Korean pro-democracy movement in the 1980s and the Gwangju uprising. There are so many similarities between Gwangju uprising and the ongoing Hong Kong uprising. Although I would not pretend to be an expert in Korean history, both peoples have faced crude crackdowns by despotic regimes, gruesome police brutality, endless political trials, and the downfall of free press. It took me three days to finish watching a Korean movie called 1987, When the Day Comes. As the movie invoked many of my traumatic memories and I have had to pause because of the pain of being made to imagine the dark hours ahead. Having said that, with courage, strategy and determination, I, I, I trust that Hong Kongers and our land will be free in the world. As with Korea, the day must come. So I'd like to say thank you to the other presenters and hosts for providing the venue for this important dialogue. Um, our group, the Soul Based Transitional Justice Working Group, uh, formed in 2014 to focus on doing documentation for human rights abuses actually uh, in North Korea, but specifically using uh, more advanced technologies to record these abuses. Our main projects, we have three of them. Uh, we have our flagship mapping project, which looks to identify the locations of killing sites and human remains in North Korea. Our Footprints Project, which records and publicizes information on abductees taken by the North Korean state. And then finally, our Global Project, which looks to support documentation groups and human rights advocates in other countries. Um, and so it's from these contexts that I'd like to speak uh, a little bit more broadly about the zoomed out long-term view of justice issues facing Hong Kong from the transitional justice perspective. Much of this might be a little bit tangible or abstract at the present moment. Uh, I do think it is useful to think of what justice mechanisms could look like in the future to help focus efforts in the present. So to do this, I'll briefly explain what exactly the transitional justice perspective entails, then talk about the role of civil society and documentation specifically, before finally offering some thoughts on how Hong Kong can be supported from Korea. So broadly defined, transitional justice refers to how countries emerge from periods or conflict of repression and how they then address large scale or systematic human rights violations that are so severe or widespread that they fall outside of what the normal justice system is designed to handle. Uh, and we often talk about four or five pillars of transitional justice. So firstly, uh, accountability. Criminal prosecutions often form the foundation 
of uh, the transition that happens in a society. So these can be criminal prosecutions uh, directed towards high level, high level prosecutions, or actually the day-to-day -day working level abusers of uh, those who actually commit the abuses themselves. Um, these efforts are usually calibrated to the local context so um, they can range quite widely from Rwanda's GACA courts to international efforts such as the ICC, the ICJ, um, and often even uh, hybrid efforts uh, like was seen in Cambodia. Of course, uh, local justice mechanisms can also be created uh, in places where that's possible. The second pillar uh, is reform. So this is where uh, guaranteeing non-recurrence of abuses or violence comes into play. Uh, and so this includes reforms of laws and institutions, including the police, judiciary, military, and military intelligence. Truth-seeking is the third pillar, uh, or fact-finding. Uh, these processes look into human rights violation uh, and are usually non-judicial bodies. Uh, they're varied, but often look at not only events, but also their causes. Uh, the most famous one example of this would be the Truth and Reconciliation Commission from South Africa. Uh, these are important pieces where the general public can interface with the work of what the transition is actually happening. Um, so civil society and the general public often have a larger voice here. The fourth pillar, uh, we can talk about reparations. Uh, and so reparations here, um, can include individual, collective, material, or symbolic reparations. Um, sometimes this takes the form of exemption from military service, uh, guarantees of jobs, pensions. Um, and so th there's a, quite a range of mechanisms here, um, but I think there will be some more specific ones we can talk about in relation to Hong Kong. Um, but before we get to that, I want to talk about an often uh, underemphasized but equally important fifth pillar of transitional justice, and that's memorialization. So in Hong Kong, we've seen uh, memorialization actually as a powerful tool that's been used by civil society in the past, um, but which is being repressed, and we can see the effects of it now. Um, I think the most easy example to, to begin this discussion with is the Tiananmen Memorial uh, that happens on June 4th in Victoria Park each year in Hong Kong. Um, usually these vigils are candlelit and attended by thousands of people, um, but in recent years, of course, they've been completely blocked by the police. Um, and you, I, I think to see the importance of memorialization here, we can really understand its power. Why, why go to the effort of blocking memorialization if it's not actually a powerful tool? Um, memorialization is an important piece of societies moving forward while healing from the past. Um, I think another good example coming from South Korea would be the Jeju Sasam Sakon and the memorialization that has been possible now but was not possible in the past. Um, we can really see how uh, fact-finding and truth-seeking in addition to memorialization can help people understand what happened in the past so that they can heal and move forward uh, in the future. So, to sum up those more abstract ideas, um, I'd like to localize this in Hong Kong by talking about the five demands from the protesters um, and mapping those onto a transitional justice framework and then hopefully um, advancing from there. So to talk about uh, reform, I think we can point to the withdrawal of the extradition bill as a central piece of uh, reforming uh, uh, a goal of reform in Hong Kong. For truth-seeking, we can look to the protesters' demands of the Commission of Inquiry into police brutality and actually uh, retracting the classification of protesters as rioters as well. For reparations, uh, we can talk about amnesty for arrested protesters and also clearing their reputations um, as well. And then finally, also under the reform category, I think uh, dual suffrage, universal suffrage, meaning for both the Legislative Council and the Chief Executive, uh, will be an important piece. So I'd like to close off with some recommendations and maybe some opportunities for future advocacy and activity. Uh, firstly, I think it's important to support those in exile. We've heard this from the speakers today, um, and it seems like a clear need that those who are fleeing Hong Kong need to be supported. 
This is both physically um, where possible, they need safe havens um, and countries to flee to, um, but then also to be supported with public statements from uh, neighboring democracies. When it comes to Korea, uh, I believe we can push the government to make, a Korea, make Korea a safe haven for those fleeing Hong Kong. Um, a few concrete ways to do this might be to provide more scholarships of those people fleeing from Hong Kong um, and also, also offer more opportunities to settle here. Next, I'd like to recommend that uh, we support the work of civil society documenters and the space for civil society to act freely. This is a space that needs active democratic protection. Uh, as other speakers have referenced, different society, civil society actors all have an interest in protecting this space. And so a shrinking of this space or an attack in this space, um, while initially only targeted at one group, uh, sooner or later actually affects other groups and causes. So this space is essential to a well-functioning democracy and so it needs to be actively protected. On the documentation topic, um, two immediate needs that come to mind may relate to tracking detainees and case progresses. Um, there are of course technology tools that exist to track these and publicize this information online uh, so that governments and other stakeholders can make informed decisions. Uh, in preparation for accountability, uh, I believe chain of command in the police and other security agencies, uh, it would be a good idea to map this. Um, and again, there are databases specifically designed um, that can make this data uh, organized for efficient analysis for use by civil society and then later on uh, accountability processes also. Then finally, um, I'd like to echo some of the thoughts of the other speakers as well and say that Korea has a unique opportunity to advocate for the protection of democracies internationally. Uh, Korea's soft power and economic influence can be used to support democracy in the region. And what we're seeing in Hong Kong could easily be replicated in other contexts. Um, and so I would like to encourage uh, the people here today to use that power. Ted Hui Ninke, Chimun Trigosh Pundeo, Chim Hojuezo, Chiwan Paco, Itawashan de Chim Hong Kong, a Kishim Bundri, Hangu, Eso Chiwan Paco, Hesite, Oton, Oromi, Inunji, Kungum Hagoyo, Kurgo Chicha, Penji, Hoju Kishimenso, the Kyoton, to Hanguke, Sosodo, Jogum Chiwan Hesiman, Choketa, the Kishin, Pubundri, Inunji, Kungumamida. Uh, well, I would like to pose my question to Mr. Ted Hui. And I know that you are staying in Australia and that you have received very support from the Australian government. I was wondering, did you consider coming to South Korea for uh, to continue your activities? Was there any difficulties that arose that stopped you from coming here by any chance? Or is there anything that you think that the Korean government should do to provide more support to uh, the activists that are on exile? Uh, exactly something I'd like to address. Um, because uh, in my decision to move to Australia, I'm determined to be more focused on uh, Asia, Indo-Pacific uh, regions, and, and to do lobbying and my advocacy work there. So, of course, uh, South Korea is a very important uh, ally and, of course, uh, stakeholder in the region. But, of course, uh, why I am hesitant in going to South Korea because of the uh, extradition treaty that South Korea has, still has, an existing one with the Hong Kong regime and, of course, also with China. And this is something quite confusing to me personally and to many Hong Kongers because we understand South Korea to be a free country and with a mature and uh, established democracy. But in face of uh, police brutality and all the brutal crackdown of human rights and abuses uh, of human rights in, in Hong Kong and in different parts of China, and South Korea didn't uh, follow suit of many free countries in the world of uh, suspending the extradition treaties that, uh, it, that is in place with Hong Kong's regimes or with Beijing. So I would personally worry about my safety 
when I travel to Australia, as as I worried about my safety if I travel to uh, semi-free countries like Indonesia, or the Philippines, Sri Lanka, Malaysia, Singapore. Yeah, but I, I personally believe that uh, South Korea shouldn't be on that list of making people like me worried about our safeties. But whenever uh, the treaty is in place, I'm worried about being invited back to China and for, for serving my jail times and decades for uh, perhaps for life. So this is exactly what I believe the South Korean government mm. can be doing. And it's not as complicated as uh, economic boycotts or uh, sanctions that needs to part, go through very complicated processes. And so to stop the extradition treaty with the Hong Kong regime and with Beijing, it, I believe it's uh, first priority and the South Korean government should consider in supporting Hong Kong's cause. Can I, can I add something to that quickly? Um, I was actually, because of COVID, we have not had a real need to travel, but I'm, I've, I mean, I've, I have a need to travel. I have family in the Philippines and, um, you know, I have been advised by informally been advised by my government uh, that I should be careful where I travel to because there are countries who have not gotten rid of the uh, gotten rid of the extradition treaty. Uh, the chances of me being extradited as an American citizen, they consider are fairly low. However, it gets back to the point that I made before. The Chinese Communist Party is much more aggressive abroad than we've ever seen before. They're not hiding behind. Um, they're not hiding back in their consulates and their embassies. And there's little doubt in my mind that if they thought they could, in a place like the Philippines or some other place, if they thought they could pressure somebody to do it, I think they would try to at least get you picked up. So I think that's quite a uh, quite a quite an issue to worry about. I hope with Ted and Mark that uh, the extradition treaty is a big concern to many of us, especially uh, we are in exile, uh, forcing to self uh, exile. Uh, there are a number of countries that uh, we dare not to uh, to to visit or even take a transit flight. For example, uh, Singapore. Uh, some uh, actually, uh, Belgium is also a, a dangerous place because of the extradition treaty with China. So uh, we don't uh, want to see that uh, Korea could become another treaty that could pose a uh, great danger to us if we try to travel to South Korea. But uh, I think I, or maybe we, uh, do hope to visit Korea after the COVID or pandemic. Myanmar's 경우에 이제 국내 체류 중인 미얀마인들에 대해서 인도적 특별 체류 조치를 했었거든요. 그리고 난민 신청을 그러니까 민주화 운동에 참여했다라는 그것을 사유로 해서 난민 신청을 하고 계신 분도 있으시고요. 근데 이제 홍콩에 대해서는 좀 적극적으로 이런 방법을 저희가 찾고 있지 않는 것 같아서 조금 저도 안타깝고 부끄러운 마음이 들기도 합니다. 아, 국내에서 좀 방법을 찾기 위해 노력을 하겠습니다. 같이 도와주실 거죠? <laughs> 네. 질문 네, 해주세요. Before we go on, I'd just like to um, just say a few comments on the answers that I heard today. Uh, thank you for your answers. Actually, in Korea, we have people from Myanmar who have, uh, who have received a special um, entry rights to Korea because of their participation in the, um, in the struggle that they have in Myanmar. And some of the activists have actually applied for refugee status and they are allowed to stay in Korea. But in case of Hong Kong, I do think the Korean government is being very active in finding a way to support uh, the activists in Hong Kong. And I find that uh, quite shameful. And I do give my word that I will try uh, my best to find a way in which we can really resolve this problem. Uh, you mentioned that it is getting harder and harder for, to do business there in Hong Kong. So. I was wondering, uh, what is the CCP's terminal goal here? Because uh, when we look back into Korea's history, back in 1987, when we won our democracy and universal suffrage, the turning point there was that the Korean military dictators, they could not afford losing the economy or lose the society uh, for their own good. Because... Uh, we have our understanding here saying that some people here in Korea say that China uh, has changed from its stances in 1997, saying that 
it no longer need, needs Hong Kong for their economy. Say China's economy has grown big, and Hong Kong is now only a minor portion of it. So they can afford to lose it. We perceive it as so. That is the reason they're going really harsh on the Hong Kong's democracy, and they are actually uh, not afraid of uh, losing Hong Kong. So, so I'm asking this question because we mentioned sanctions here, and would any sanctions on uh, Hong Kong itself would bring irreversible damage to the economy and the people? Uh, job there and let's say uh, other uh, society. So we're really afraid what that sanction should be aimed uh, towards. And I remember uh, lawmaker Hui mentioned uh, boycotts on uh, the upcoming Winter Olympics there in Beijing. And I see it is quite a not possible for Korea to participate in that effort, but would there be other political methods that we can take to uh, put pressure on the Chinese uh, CCP? Uh, because, I mean, to be honest, Korean economy is now deeply entangled with China now, so it is quite impossible for us to give up on that portion. So would there be any other measures that we can take well, so, okay, so two questions. One for Mark. Uh, uh, I guess I'll let Ted handle the Olympics thing. Um, look, w one of the things I mean, you know, I've I've been involved in every ch the chambers of commerce. I've I've lobbied. I've actually lobbied back in the pre ninety seven. I lobbied for M MFN for China. Mm -hmm. and, you know, I've been in. I I I I actually have a column. I know the Hong Kong economy quite well. Uh, look. There's no doubt that if you're the, the measure they use to measure the importance of the Hong Kong economy is almost is it's archaic. In mm -hmm. other words, what they're doing is they're looking at well, there's a bigger containment or terminal in Shanghai. There's a bigger containment or terminal in Shenzhen. Mm -hmm. That's never been Hong Kong's true worth to China. Hong Kong's worth has been three things. It's been the rule of law. In other words, you could do contracts in Hong Kong and China. And they, and they meant something. In other words, you didn't have to run back to New York or things like that. It's been an international financial center where, quite frankly, the Chinese actually, they do not have a convertible currency. The renminbi and yuan is not convertible. They still have to have some place where they have some form of control to change their currency. And that is Hong Kong. Out on the international marketplace, they really don't have the same level of control doing the currency transactions as they do and the security they would have in Hong Kong, working with Chinese banks and also large Hong Kong banks. But the third thing that Hong Kong has always provided and traditionally provided, it has been a source of FDI and what I would call quality funding. In other words, across the border from mm -hmm. Hong Kong is, <clears throat> with no offense to other nations, probably the most dynamic tech center in, the, in all of Asia. You know, in other words, it's not Silicon Valley, but certainly it ranks up there with Israel and some of the other places. And it's called Shenzhen. And funding for Shenzhen exclusively almost flows through Hong Kong in terms of uh, startup money. These are entrepreneurs, think Zoom, think all these companies that start up. The international knowledge-based private equity guys, they don't come through Shanghai that often. They come through Hong Kong. So destroying Hong Kong actually has a ripple effect throughout the Chinese economy. The, the other thing that Hong Kong brings is it brings an example of best business practices. In other words, if the Hong Kong stock market and the Hong Kong markets have to be open, transparent, and everything else, then the China markets have to be that. It's the reason why we've seen for the last 20 years every Chinese city trying to convince the rest of the world that they have the same laws and administrations and free flow of capital as you do in Hong Kong. So in other words, yes, it's, it's kind of like saying that, uh, okay, New York City is not as valuable as it is today because we have Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't argue that Hong Kong is absolutely uh, as, as important as it was 25 years ago in terms of some things such as trade, manufacturing, and things like that. 
But I would argue that it's even more important than it is for the sectors that China wants to move into, which is tech financing and things like that. But most importantly, and it's, it's, it can't be overstated, and I'm, I'm not one that gives lawyers much credit, but look, <laughs> the rule of law is everything. I mean, if you can't have a contract that is viable in, in China, then you're, you're going to have trouble doing business there. I mean, I think if I, I used to deal with a lot of Korean shipping companies, Port of, point of arbitration that they would accept was Hong Kong. Um, they didn't want to, you know, and, 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 and that's, the, that's the issue that really I think that, that people, you know, are, are not understanding there. As far as things like real estate prices, Hong Kong is a small town. It's six million people. Um, and people are leaving at a rapid pace. And you know what? The Chinese have enough money up there and they can flood enough people. So the, they can keep the property market floating. They can keep everything going. But we're about to see something come out from the Biden administration tomorrow. Mm -hmm. It's my belief that that doesn't really have to do about how important Hong Kong is to China but it's really a warning to American businesses, and it's something Koreans should consider as well, that you have to have both eyes open now in Hong Kong and before you can count on the rule of law and other things. I fully, I fully understand the Korean, I mean, you, you trade with your neighbors. Canada is still the United States' biggest trading partner, and there's, you know, I, I think they remain our biggest one, and there's only 26 million of them. So I fully, I've spoken with Korean politicians multiple times, I fully understand that you're not going to win a lot of support saying, hey, let's start having an economic war with uh, with China. You know, there's a lot of jobs on the line. But I do think and I think it, it is completely prevalent and and helps Korean businesses to hold China's feet to the fire when it mm -hmm. comes to a, a, abiding by the international international norms that were, have been previously set in Hong Kong. And asking, making sure that Korean businesses are protected. And I'm sure the first time you bring that up, just like they didn't like your cruelty remark, I'm mm -hmm. sure you'll get a lecture from China about small nations should just obey big <laughs> nations. So, you know, I mean, um, so I, I mean, I, so I, I do, so, I do so, think Hong Kong's moderately more important than that they want to say it is. Mm -hmm. So, 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 Mark, you believe that the Chinese government wouldn't uh, end up daring to uh, totally crack down Hong Kong's economy? At I, 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 I quote a guy named Bill McGurn at the Wall Street Journal: mm -hmm. Hong Kong, with the with the, with with Hong, the Chinese handling the Chinese Communist Party handling Hong Kong, is a gorilla with a Stradivarius. Mm -hmm. I mean, a free market is so important, and it's so difficult. My personal belief is, is quite frankly, I think the Chinese Communist Party has a different role for, and I think your, your national security people will probably start seeing it. I think they intend to weaponize Hong Kong. And what I mean by that is they want to pull Chinese companies back from overseas markets, the New York Stock Exchange, and they want to have China using Hong Kong as a financial hub for China's interest. In other words, not an international hub, mm -hmm. but basically a Chinese hub, and they'll basically fund it through all their massive pension funds and everything like that. But my belief is you're going to see the, the Chinese Communist Party to keep Hong Kong busy and not to fall flat on their face. I think they'll just be, they'll start trying to run Chinese business mm -hmm. through Hong Kong, and they'll be coming to places like Korea. So if Korean companies were going to say list mm -hmm. in the U.S., they will desperately try to get Korean companies to come to Hong Kong. But that holds that holds if, if Hong Kong's not a safe market, does that really do Korean companies really want to go there? You know, and so I, I, that's what I see. I think I think I think they they know that their failures in Hong Kong are becoming widespread. And I think they'll do anything they can to keep those numbers up and, th and they'll make the argument with numbers. So you, you will start seeing um uh, a lot of Chinese companies list in Hong Kong that, you know, will only be of interest to Chinese investors because they won't have the transparency that Hong Kong will lose the transparency and the uh, the rule of law. And so it, it'll become a place people can invest in from abroad. Because uh, Mark has uh, provided a comprehensive answer, I just want to provide some data uh, for, for reference. So back in uh, 2017, uh, around 63 percent of the foreign direct investment FDI and uh, outward direct investment uh, from China uh, has to has to be ripped through Hong Kong. So uh, this shows the strategic importance of Hong Kong 
uh, to China economically. So, uh, in so in May 2020, uh, there was a public survey in Hong Kong, uh, in which there were around 370 correspondents uh, participated in such survey, and then uh, there was a question uh, which is. Uh, asking uh, whether Hong Kongers uh, try to uh, would want to pursue some kind of uh, strong economic sanction or uh, Lam Chao, or if we burn you burn with us a strategy with China. So uh, with five marks as a full mark uh, around, uh, the average score was 4.2 marks. So this shows the determination of Hong Kongers try to uh, call for strong economic sanction against Hong Kong as the city and uh, against China. So uh, these are just some background information for reference regarding the questions of uh winter olympics the boycott and just try to imagine the scene that you will see on tv during the Olymp during winter olympics that head of state from different countries from free countries and president of south korea will be shaking hands with xi jinping or uh, to greet each other to give a speech and working on uh, celebrating together uh, that scene is very, very discouraging for Hong Kongers fighting for freedom and democracies. It will be outrageous for people being locked up in jails because the world uh, acts as if nothing's happening and business is as usual. That's why uh, we have a call for a boycott of the Winter Olympics. Um, but having been, having been a politician for, for the last decade, for more than 10 years, I understand uh, the importance of um, compromises and getting consensus. So uh, I'm a pragmatic lobbyist myself. That's why there are other alternatives as to diplomatic boycotts. That means a relocation of the Winter Olympics. So if there are different options for South Korean governments, how about uh, a notion or a, a public statement about being uh, the openness, being open of considering uh, a relocation of the Winter Olympics? not in Beijing, but not a, a total boycott. I understand that it can be unfair also for the athletes. That's why uh, there are leeways of uh, other, other alternatives of doing it. And so uh, if that is not even possible, that goes back to the uh, previous suggestions, uh, proposals that uh, I mentioned, sp suspensions of the um, extradition treaties. And I believe if there are different options on the plate, um, the suspension of the extradition treaty would be uh, less less risky and be a more possible or plausible options for South Korean governments. So I, I hope that uh, uh, you will really consider this option in, instead of something impossible. Final statement from the chairperson Lee jun Seok and Liu ho Jung will be held. Chairperson Lee jun Seok, please. Well, thank you very much for uh, participating in this session today. Uh, I was really curious about what we can specifically do for uh, Hong Kongers there. And well, I learned today that uh, political boycotts and economic sanctions and maybe some other uh, possible methods of sanctions can be useful to Hong Kong people. Well. It's really hard for us, as I mentioned, to uh, help the Hong Kongers in a public manner since Chinese Communist Party is really uh, uh, harsh on us on this issue. And But as an opposition party here in Korea, we are really uh, looking forward to uh, get updates on this issue. And then uh, maybe if we win the presidential election next year, we can come up with more practical and uh, stronger solutions to help the people of Hong Kong. So uh, uh, let's keep in touch and share more ideas uh, in the future. And I will definitely, uh, personally, support your uh, efforts uh, always. Yeah. Uh, so, 
아시아 민주주의의 상징이 된것 같다 그렇게 느꼈습니다. 그리고 여기 계신 분들이 그 주역이라고 생각합니다. Uh, thank you for everybody's participation today. I I'm much more impressed at what we have been able to talk, and there's so much that we have talked about today. So thank you once again. I mentioned that I met with the um, youth activists from Thailand and Myanmar, and that they mentioned that they were inspired by not only the democratic uprising in Korea, but also in Hong Kong. So I think not only Korea, but Hong Kong is also becoming a symbol of democracy in Asia, and you are the heroes in this effort. 네, 이미 경험하고 계시겠지만 긴 싸움이 될 것인데요. 사실 한국에서도 내용은 조금 다르지만 네. 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 한국에서도 내용은 조금 다르지만 정치적 반대 세력을 탄압하기 위함이라는 그런 목적은 같은 국가 보안법이 있습니다. 그리고 또 요즘에 저희도 언론법 개정 관련해서 과도한 언론 탄압이라는 비판이 이어지고 있는데요. 그러나 저희는 끝내 악법은 폐지될 거고 언론을 탄압하는 일도 벌어지지 않으리라 믿고 있습니다. 왜냐하면 저희는 이미 과거에 승리한 경험이 있기 때문에 있기 때문입니다. 그래서 저희는 그런 믿음을 가질 수 있는데요. 어, 느리지만 단단하게 하나씩 해결해 나갈 수 있을 거라고 믿습니다. 홍콩도요. 그리고 여러분이 끝까지 지치지 않고 포기하지 않으셨으면 좋겠습니다. 여러분 곁에서 그 힘이 되고 싶습니다. And I know that you are already experiencing it but and realizing it but this will be a long term struggle. It will be a long fight. And in Korea we also have um Uh, sim similar um, acts like the National Security Act. We also have that in Korea, which opposes any political opposition uh, and tries to suppress it. So we also have that. And recently we are working on a media act um, that is going to be amended, but many think that it is a gr too much of a suppression on free uh, press. So um, w w I believe that um, evil... laws, bad laws will be, will not be passed and that the freedom of press will remain because we achieved this before and uh, we have already, we have that trust in ourselves and confidence that uh, the freedom of press, the freedom of speech will be protected going forward. And so I hope that uh, you will not lose heart in that process, in this long march that you have of, ahead of you, that it, Taking step by step, it will be slow, but there will be achievements made in the, along the way. And I hope that uh, you will never give up and that um, we promise to be by your side in that journey. So thank you. 네, 아, 저 있습니다. 저인데요 <웃음> 네. 그리고 또, 어, 민주주의 사회를 살아간, 민주 사회를 살아가는 한국 청년들에게 이렇게 민주주의를 위해 연대하는 건 어색한 일이 아니거든요. 저희 둘이 당은 다르지만, 어, 이런 홍콩의 민주주의를 위한 활동에 좀 앞으로도 함께 해주시면 좋겠다라는 생각이 들었고요. 참석해 주셔서 감사합니다. 그리고 오늘 참석해 주신 분들께서 알려주신 내용 잘 기록을 했고요. 어, 함께 연대할 수 있는 방안을 네, 찾겠습니다. 그리고 오늘 참석해 주신 분들께 다시 한번 정말 감사드리고 강력한 연대를 보내드리고 싶습니다. 앞으로 이런 자리를 좀 자주 만들 수 있도록 노력하겠습니다. 감사합니다. Um, for the Korean youth um, to fight for democracy and to stand in solidarity is not awkward. It's not, un it's not new for us. And that is why I was very happy to welcome uh, Chairman uh, Lee Jun Sok from the um, People Power Party. And although we are different political parties, we have the same goal. And I think that we can really join in efforts when we, if we work together. So I hope that he will continue to be uh, with us and take part in this effort together. And um, today I have actually written down everything that I can um, from your words and I, w I promise to really search a way in which we can continue the solidarity. I really appreciate all the words that you have said today and I've learned a lot and I hope that we can continue to keep in touch and to have these um, roundtables to really share views to see what is going on and so I, I send you my strongest support and solidarity. So thank you once again. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much. Before we close down the round table, let's hear a final short say from our guest speakers.
starting from Ted Hui, please. Yes, thank you so much, everyone, and thank you for your strong support. I believe it's really important, uh, not only on a diplomatic level, but in the civil society level, that uh, we are given opportunity uh, so that uh, the Koreans and ordinary citizens and understand what's the real situation in Hong Kong. And I understand that for South Koreans, and either you are uh, politicians or citizens, uh, with your relationship with China and your values uh, of freedom and democracies, uh, it's um, it's easy to put yourself to put the country in a very difficult situations with tough choices, difficult choices uh, in terms of economic uh, interests and trade relationships. And on the other hand, you have human rights and freedoms to protect. But uh, I believe that uh, freedom and democracies as universal values will always prevail. And I look forward into more and more exchanges uh, with uh, South Koreans, politicians, and people like you. And I hope to stay in touch with you and um, so that we can collaborate uh, in future uh, development of democracy and freedom in Hong Kong. Thank you very much for your time today. Thank you very much for your time today. Um, as I would say, the only thing that I keep driving home is, is you know, no, no free press, no free markets. And the one thing I would say, I, I very much understand that South Korea, I mean, that Korea is very close to China economically. I understand that uh, they do take great umbrage and they like to huff and puff. But I would say that's mostly what that's all they do. And I, I do think it's important um, every once in a while for people to uh, take their ideas of freedom and democracy out for a walk. Uh, no matter what the neighbor says. Um, so I do think, quite frankly, I think uh, I, I do believe the Korean people, um, they may not be looking for uh, sanctions. They may not be looking for some other things. But I don't think it's ever a loser in a democratic society, whether it's Korea, Lithuania, Mexico or the U.S., to stand up and say, we believe in human rights. We believe in democracy. We believe in a free press. And we wish you would, too. I think it will, I think they, they'll huff and puff, but that's all they'll do. Thanks for organizing this event. So it is uh, my honor to speak today. Uh, so my last word or last remark for this event is that uh, I would say Korea plays a vital role in the geopolitics of the Asia Pacific region. So with the CCP as the common threat to the existence of the democratic governments in Korea, Japan, and Taiwan, uh, I do think that Korea has taken a good move to join the G7 summit in the UK in June. Uh, just a few weeks ago. So I think it's also time for the D10 alliance to be formed as a league of democratic countries while the UN has been paralyzed by China. So uh, so this is my last remark. And some people may say, may say uh, Hong Kongers uh, seems to be fighting a losing battle, but I don't think so. I do see hope uh, because of the shift of the paradigm. And even though it may be seems like a losing battle, we will continue to fight because, uh, after all, Hong Kong is our hometown, home city, and home country. I'd also like to say thank you for the organizers of this event. Uh, it's really encouraging to see cross-party cooperation on democracy and human rights issues. Um, and hopefully this will expand and that uh, more interest will be gathered here. And I think this is a good example of what's possible um, across party lines. So thank you again.